Coming up on Texilla, my gaming PC on a budget. Woohoo! Pull a Norton and fix your iPhone all by yourself. And which is the better media set top box? Roku, Boxybox, or the Xbox 360? All that plus a stack of your viewer questions. So heat up some biscuits and pour on the country milk gravy, because Texilla starts now. This episode of Texella is made possible by Mass Effect 2, GoToAssist Express, and GoDaddy.com. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Veronica Belmont. Welcome to Techzilla, hands-on reviews of the latest tech and how to make the most out of the gear that you've already got. Whether you're a beginner or tech support for your friends and family, if you've got a question about tech or where to get the best pie cake in town, we've got an answer for you. Or Roger does, at least. I, I should point out for anyone who has not seen it, it's there's like somebody the took mythical like, pie cake. like 17 different kinds of pies and cake and baked them into the one giant gloppy mess. Yes. Roger has been obsessed with it. It has actually overtaken his, his pineapple, pineapple upside down cake. Well, obsession. you know, you know what it does. It brings together the two very dissonant camps of pie versus cake. Mostly to me, it looks like a it's giant like the pie pancake of... versus waffles feud. Pie versus cake divides people. It brings people apart. This brings I love them back pie. together. I love cake. I am unbelievably disgusted by the idea of mixing this whole mess together like I'm this. not. I ate pie all the way across the country. When I drove cross country, I ate pie at every single restaurant I went to. So why does the pie cake appeal to you Because then? I also enjoy cake. Right. And I don't want to have to choose. I want both things at once. You have the metabolism of a freaking lemming. You have to eat like two times your body <laughs> weight to not disappear. I have to eat like every four hours you should or else eat I get faint. both pie and cake and then you wouldn't have to eat so much. This Excellent. is not tech! Are, you, are your feet better? You were like, you were hurting after like nine days oh, of seeing My this. feet are completely flat, so if I don't have like, I need to get those ergonomic shoes, like the special walking shoes like Tom Merritt has. <laughs> the special because walking those, shoes. <laughs> those are nice, because they give you a nice like little workout on your legs too when you're walking and your feet don't get as tired. Hopefully we have video rolling. But they don't have Tom like fashionable days. girl versions of those shoes yet, so I wear my Perhaps regular shoes. Perhaps you could shoes, wear a walking shoe. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> I, I'm feeling a little better though. Which makes me want to fire up the sarcasm emoticon. Not. Oh, God. Yeah, so for those of you who I, many people have discovered over the centuries that sarcasm does not essentially come through as well in print as it does in the spoken word. Mm -hmm. Many people have tried to indicate this with emoticons over the year. Now somebody has come up with the idea of making basically making a custom sarcasm emoticon and it only costs two dollars yeah I don't know what the problem is I think that's an excellent price you don't need a, a special icon for that, <laughs> did you? But I think that came across pr pretty clear. But I don't understand. I mean, we've been able to do this for, for years now. I mean, I just use the fake little sarcasm tag, the slash sarcasm at the end of a sentence. That works Is nicely. That's what that meant. Apparently, there's also one of an exclamation point about with parentheses that? around it. Huh? I'm just realizing that completely. I didn't know that was a sarcasm emoticon, and now I know that. that well, that's what I use for dozens my Dozens of my things I've read sarcasm. from you in the past few weeks has meant something completely different than a what backwards, I thought. A backwards upside down. And question mark is also used very often as a sarcasm mark. How do you make a backwards upside down question eh, you, you mark? Cut and paste. Uh, <laughs> <That's> a, <laughs> search there's, Google there's emoticon sarcasm. Too, but I, I prefer to just copy and paste things, which you can also do with the $2 sarcasm quotation mark also. So here's a question for everyone in the audience. Do you like emoticons? Do you want to see more of them in your written communications? Or do you want them to die, die, die? Nah, I think they're fun once in a while, but I'm not going to pay <laughs> for them. Um, but anyway, here we got ourselves a jam-packed show today. Yeah, we're going to actually find little, viewers. A little bit later on, we're going to rebuild what's left of my iPhone screen. Oh. oh, you know what I forgot to tell everybody about? What? The big question of CES is it safe for me to buy a new head unit for my truck? Oh. The answer is yes. Alpine is coming out with a new uh, top of the line uh, head unit. The the Alpine X305S, which basically adds Pandora, the ability to run Pandora off of an iPhone into the head unit. It's nice. coming out later this year. So uh, as much as I enjoy it, Pandora in the car. I feel comfortable with buying the X305. We're going to be installing that in my truck, reviewing it and the audio processing capabilities a little bit later on in the year. Fantastic. Now, let's talk about something we hinted at before we took off for CES, building Veronica over here, a new gaming machine. Woohoo! 
Now, Veronica is primarily a World of Warcraft player, not a first person shooter, but I guess we should point out though, first person shooter is really the motivation for you to finally upgrade. Well, first person shooter-ish. I mean, I've been playing a lot of Left 4 Dead 2 with Roger, and, and I decided getting... I needed a bit of a competitive advantage. Mm. Mm, how should we say? This Veronica has been using a PC cobbled together from various, basically I think paperweights around the PC gamer <laughs> offices. And we should, props PC gamer, Veronica wanted to get a little more World of Warcraft on that her notebook would let her. Exactly. I was using my MacBook Pro as my World of Warcraft machine, and I wanted to play other games and have a dedicated gaming box. And so they found some parts that were laying around from other machines that they had taken apart. <laughs> and they weren't the newest components, but they worked when you put them together to make a pretty decent box. But it's time. It's time to move on. It's time to get something a little more intense. But a not more to gamer break centric. the budget. We got the nasty rent here in San Francisco. Veronica's not completely unhinged with the gaming lifestyle. So you're looking for about five, six hundred bucks? Yeah, that would be optimal. Optimal. Ideally, a six hundred dollar sort of upgrade. So while we wait for the the, the UPS, the FedEx, the various and sundry, we bought a lot of these parts online. They're being shipped here right now. Let's go over our specs for Veronica's gaming machine. All right. Well, first up is the CPU and the motherboard. Unlike other components, what you want for a CPU will decide what you get, of course, for your motherboard. We had two options spec'd out. Option number one was an AMD Athlon 2 X4 620 quad core processor running at 2.6 gigahertz with an Asus motherboard, uh, sporting DDR3 support and the AM3 socket. Price for both around $200. At $100, the AMD 620 is the cheapest quad core on the market. Not bad. Option number two is Intel's Core i5-750 Linfield 2.66 GHz quad-core processor made with an Asus P7 P55 LX board with a P55 chipset with DDR3 support. The price for the CPU, $200, and the price for the board, around $130, total being $330. It's a little more on the expensive side. Yeah, basically the, the Core i5-750 wins in almost all the performance categories against the Athlon 2620, but you're spending more money, about 100 bucks. And we got to say, like, you know, it's 100 bucks you could spend, you said that, you, we, we, just say what you just say when you want to say that I'm going to spend it on purses. That's okay, what you want to say? You want to spend more money on shoes and purses? You go with the. I'm Athlon. a girl of many varied, many varied likes. Ladies and gentlemen, we will be <laughs> going. We will be going with the Athlon Two to save a little bit of cash and and basically to also give you more money for your graphics card and your storage, your desperately yes. needed storage upgrade. <laughs> yes, and I'll, second on the list though would be RAM, of course, because this is a gaming box. Mm -hmm. I need a decent amount of RAM. Um, in our books, the more the merrier with 64-bit operating systems, but four gigabytes is ideal. Whether you're running a 32-bit or 64-bit operating system, mm -hmm. four gigabytes is a good balance between price and performance. We went with a pair of two gigabyte XMS3 DDR3 1333 stick from Corsair. There's nothing particularly unique about our choice, but for $95 on Newegg, you know, we bought them and we've had great success with the brand in the past, mm -hmm. so I don't really see the problem. No, and you know, <laughs> if, if you want to run less than four gigabytes, and I really don't recommend that, go with the 32-bit version. The, basically, the 32-bit version and the 64-bit versions of Windows 7 base pretty much both come on the same disk. You can go either way. Mm -hmm. If you have less than four gigabytes, go with the 32-bit version. A video right. card. Yes, third on the list is video cards, of course. Um, a gaming PC is nothing without a decent 3D-capable video card. And currently, the Value King is ATI's HD 5770 series. Although not as fast as ATI's or NVIDIA's higher-end offerings, from a budget standpoint, they're a great value at $166. With solid performance and support for DirectX 11 and Crossfire support, this card is a great start for those who want to get into PC gaming on the cheap and be ready for games that support DirectX 11. I just bought one of those to upgrade my Core oh. i7 system. Oh, well, that makes to sense. Improve good. the gaming abilities of it. Fantastic. Next, of course, would be the drives. Um, honestly, hard drives are kind of a dime a dozen. We could have spent more and picked up an SSD for the boot OS drive, but uh, that you could have spent like five times as much in your hard drive and yeah. picked up. But look, do you want to boot OS? OS, you want to boot your operating system faster. You want faster performance. You know, when you're working with big video files and stuff, great. Get an SSD drive. Gaming, all of the performances. Once you've loaded the game, all mm -hmm. the performance is in the the processor and the memory and the GPU. Yeah, so we just settled on the Western Digital Black, the 500 gigabyte version. So we could have gone, paid a little bit more. Bucks. Yeah, 65 bucks. We like can't quintupled really go wrong your that. storage capability. Well, I guess we tripled your storage. Trip three, you have now have three and better. a half times as much storage than mm -hmm. your previous machine. Yeah, for another for 30 bucks, bucks, we could have gone to one terabyte. But 
you know, we're trying to pick and choose where we save our money. And that was one place where we could save a little bit. So it worked out well. And uh, we also got an optical drive for 26 bucks, so a light DVD Another spot drive. To save. Look, unless you're running Blu-ray movies, there's no point in getting a Blu-ray drive. And 26 they're pretty I much all 26 I have never bucks. burned a DVD on, on my gaming PC. Never? Never. I've never. I literally do nothing but gaming. I mean, I could you know, maybe make save backups to a disc, and I can try like my Steam one of the games old... on there or something, but I have external hard drives that I can do that with. <laughs> That's all I need. No, I'm just sitting there, I'm like, oh, we could do probably save another 20 bucks and recycle even... a DVD drive. Yeah, I, I so... burn DVDs. I've had a broken DVD drive in my MacBook Pro for so long that I don't even remember why people ever burn things. <laughs> for It's like a totally useless feature to me data. now. <sighs> All right. Well, finally, of course, we have to give it a nice little house for everything to live in. That would be the case. We wanted to save as much as we could, so we looked for cases that included a power supply of at least 450 watts to ensure, of course, that we could run all that hardware and all the future upgrades that we want to stick in there without issue. Um, we settled on Thermaltake's Element T. Pretty generic, but it is roomy and it has enough juice to power everything. And hey, that's about 90 bucks. Could have saved some money, gone with a cheaper case, uh, power supply, can they, like collection, collective, how do we call it? Basically, combination probably yeah. would be the right word for it. But or I could have just gutted the old box and stuck everything in there. That would be another option. But I may want it at some point. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, and also the thermal take. We've we've had good luck with thermal takes combinations of of cases and and and, and power supplies because a bad power supply can create a lot of weird little problems for you. So yeah. so try to pony up on the power supply. That's why we basically spent ninety bucks on the combination instead of thirty bucks on the combination. So we spent about six hundred. $38.93, and that's not including an operating system or a keyboard and mouse because I love the combo that I have right now. But you can pick up a decent Microsoft keyboard mouse combo for 20 bucks if you want to complete the whole package. It's slightly over a $600 mark, but I think we did rather well, all things considered. We, you're getting all the toys. I know. <laughs> I did a little dance. Someone made a nice little, uh, little GIF image in the forums of me doing my happy gaming PC dance. <laughs> She's so excited. I that fully. So next week we should have all the parts in, assembled, and benchmarked so we can basically compare your existing machine against the new gaming machine. I don't want to give anything away, but I've seen some of the early benchmarks for my original PC. Not looking so good. <laughs> I won't lie to you. And of course, you know, Patrick, a gaming PC as great as this demands a game of equal or greater awesomeness, like the one from our sponsor, BioWare's Mass Effect 2, coming out January 26th. Ooh. A sequel to the wicked cool original Mass Effect game that literally set the bar for space based role playing Assassin's games. Son. Mass Effect 2 follows Junior. the journey of Commander Shepard and his or her team as they seek to uncover who or what is behind the disappearances of entire human colonies. The odds are stacked against them and Shepard's team isn't one that he can entirely trust. But if humanity is to be saved, Shepard and his or her crew must succeed in the fight for the lost. Now both Roger and I played through the first Mass Effect, and if Mass Effect 2 is anything like the original, and we definitely think it's more, prepare to be amazed. From the visuals, fights, and oh my god, the plot, if you want a game that's fun, intelligent, and challenging, we, Roger and I, recommend you check out Mass Effect 2. It's out this January 26th on both Xbox 360 and PC. Oh, and for those of you who played through the first Mass Effect, keep your saved games. You'll be able to import them into Mass Effect 2. How cool is that? Welcome to this week's freebie download pick. A free program that we find useful, fun, or incredibly interesting. This week, Prime 95. Originally written to take part in the great internet Mersenne Prime Search project, Prime 95 is also a great tool for PC system builders because it's the perfect burn-in tool. In its torture test mode, Prime 95 will put a 100% processing load in the CPU and all its little cores and continue running until a calculation error occurs or you basically thermally explode your machine and it shuts down. DIY PC builders and overclockers have been using it for years to gauge their cooling system's reliability. Using one of the three built-in test modes, you can test the CPU, the floating point unit, or a blend of everything, including the system ramp. That's the good one. So if you want to know if that PC you just built will stand up to the rigors of gaming or say 24 hours of non-stop computing doom, download Prime95 and ring out your PC today. Dropped your phone lately? Mm. Patrick has. Yep. And he managed to shatter the screen on his beloved iPhone 3G when it slipped from his fingers, bounced off the family dog, and landed face down on the path to lovely Bridal Veil Fall in Yosemite National Park. Will he drop hundreds on a replacement or repair it himself? Well, that's kind of a dumb question. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> eh. Um, yeah, could, actually, it would be like, because like, you know, there's like the prorated period of the contract and then they'll let you upgrade. Yeah, I'm not there yet. So it would be like, I think 500 and change. Ooh. Or maybe if I got lucky, I could, you know, mine's out of the warranty period. So I don't even think I could do the $200 trade in from uh, the Apple geniuses. Well, luckily, we happen to know some people that do this kind of thing. I actually got really lucky at CES. I ran into iFixit's founder, Kyle, who apparently travels with repair parts wherever he goes. I'm yeah. like, dude, I'm about to buy the, the glass repair kit. And and he's basically said he had one in his bag. So, <laughs> love to see the inside of his backpack. Two things I want to point out real quick: um, the 3G front panel kit is not the same as the 3GS. So the 3, the 3G and 3GS have different glass, despite mm -hmm. the fact they look exactly the same. Um, and hope if you drop your phone that you only break the glass and not the actual LCD and touch panel itself, because the glass sixty dollars worth of parts. The entire LCD, about $150 worth of parts that they so have got, to salvage from dead iPhones. You got lucky then. You're fine. You just I, broke the glass. I got really lucky. Now, we've had Kyle on the phone before, and he was discussing how painful working on iPhones is because I've, I've done it in the past. So the glass kit includes all of the pieces mm -hmm. and all of the parts I need for this, mm -hmm. and it's, it's, it's looking ugly. How tough is it? Let's roll to the video. So obviously my iPhone, I don't know, can you see it? Can, can we get a shot of that? Oh, there, there you, you, you can see the, obviously I've cracked the heck out of my phone up here. You can see the corner where it hit, it's all shattered. So iFixit.com, they've got the uh, iPhone 3G front panel. So we have the kit here. And number one thing you gotta do before you're setting up the kit is to print out the directions or have the directions for it up on another computer. This is very critical. The kit itself is pretty slick. It includes all of the tools you need including, uh, I should point out, obviously the 3G appropriate glass, the adhesive strips you use to reattach it to your system. Okay, it does not include the hair dryer. In this case, we're using one of these spare heaters from our office, our very, very cold office. They include a metal spudger, which is basically a pry tool, a plastic regular spudger, a Phillips double aught or double zero screwdriver, and my favorite part, a small suction cup. You're gonna see what this is for in a minute. So one thing they don't include is some tape, clear packing tape, which works pretty well. We're using blue tape because we use it for everything here. And the whole point of using the tape is to help keep the broken glass from crackling away. So you've backed up your iPod, or in this case, I've backed up my iPhone. We're gonna shut this thing down, and we're gonna remove the two super tiny double-O screws from the dock connector end of the iPhone. And I'm gonna get some of my fabulous I use it for everything, easy to remove blue tape, and I'm gonna put a little screw holder right here. And then I'm going to make sure my screwdriver is completely seated in the screw. Okay, if you can hear that clicking, you know it's all the way done. And of course it doesn't wanna come out. So let's see if we can, there we go. Here's my clicking as the threads become unseated. And there's my screw. Now I'm gonna take some of the tape and put it over the busted, janked glass end of this. And you're gonna press the suction cup down here. Let's see if we can get a firm seal on that. So, oh, and hopefully I didn't rip anything loose. So the display assembly, which is the part on this side, is still connected to the iPhone by a couple of cables. So we're gonna reach under there and we're gonna look for black ribbon cable labeled one. It's really funny, there are these little orange labels on the inside of here, that those are actually numbered inside of here. So I'm gonna see if I can get number one out without ribbing this apart. This is what your spudgers are for. Use the plastic ones if you can. There we go. One is loose. We're looking for two. So one and two are loose, and this is the one that's going to be really horrible to reassemble. It's a flat ribbon cable that slides into place. There we go, and that is everything. Okay, so this is the main body of the phone. SIM card, this is probably the main, no, the main radio, battery. And uh, let's get to the scary part. <laughs> we got one more Phillips screw to remove. 
It's right down here in the corner of the display. A couple more Phillips screws on the right side of the assembly. I'm going to turn the display over and carefully peel up the thin strip of black paint on the edge of the display assembly. Or I should say the thin strip of black tape right there. That's the first piece. We've got three more Phillips head screws to remove. One, two, and three. Uh, here comes the horrifying part. Carefully insert a metal spudger, that's this thing, in between the two metal rails along the edge of the display assembly. Gently rotate the spudger to lift the LCD up from the glass. Now if you hear a crack and some weeping, that's a sign that I have destroyed the very expensive LCD. Now we slide it to pull the ribbon cables loose, like that. So what we basically need to do is to get this metal frame off of here so we can attach the frame and holder, basically the new glass to the old frame and holder. So you can see the little frame rails on the left and right side of that. And uh, the glass essentially glues down onto this framework. So I'm going to get my heat gun on. I'm going to start with the upper left hand area of the touch screen. Hey, remember, be patient, let the heat penetrate, soften up the glue when you're prying the glass off of this plastic frame because if you break this, it's gonna be like 150 bucks to get the unit to replace it, and it's a patience thing. So if it feels like you're using too much force, you probably are, let it heat up for another 10, 20 seconds, give it another try. I'll be right back. Got all the adhesive off of there. Now we get to apply the custom fit adhesive strips that came with the package. And then we are going to drop the touch screen in place. So everybody take a deep breath with me and brace yourselves for impact. Okay, everybody take a deep cleansing breath. <laughs> so we pinch each corner for 60 seconds to help the adhesive seat. All right, this is probably the hardest part is reassembling the phone. I mean, the screws, all that. We got the tape off, everything's glued back down, our tape's back on, but we have to reattach one, two, three ribbon cables. And hopefully I haven't damaged any of them in the disassembly and reassembly process. Yeah. Wow, that felt like a system episode. Um, hey, you know what? It worked, and uh, props to iFixit for really clear directions, except for the parts where you, of course, painfully try to fill around reassembling uh, ribbon cables, which is always a nightmare. It looks a little bit different from the original touchscreen, but you know what? It works, and hey, look at that. No giant cracks in my screen. <laughs> Remind me not to drop this again. Ouch. And I should also point out that, yes, I had the fabulous screen protection film on there, and in this particular case, it didn't make a difference. <laughs> well, in that particular case. Hey. There's less extreme <laughs> cases that can, that can occur that it uh, might protect with. I do have to say thanks to the iFixit people, not only for the screen, um, but for actually going through the painful process of showing everyone how to repair their iPods and iPhones and MacBooks because this is pain, this is, these are painful to work on. Thank yeah. you for figuring that out so I didn't have to like, you know, buy a dead iPhone on, on. it's just, trust me, thanks iFixit because these things are miserable to work on. Yeah, well we do have some more questions lined up, but mm. first we have a word from one of our sponsors. Ooh. You know being the only tech support for friends and families is an exalted position. There's nothing like getting a phone call during dinner to help someone figure out how to open an email that makes you feel really needed <laughs> or hassled. 
Thankfully, there's GoToAssist Express, possibly the easiest way to give tech support to friends, family, and coworkers all over the world. It's been a lifesaver a few times for me already, and I've only been using it for a few months. When my dad got a new computer and was having trouble getting everything set up the way he wanted, I just sent him an invite over email and got right to work. No complicated installs, no configurations, no hassle. Even though I was on a Mac and he was on a PC, I could share his screen, make all the changes I needed to remotely, and even do live text chat to let him know what I was doing next. And even though I'm over 3,000 miles away, I can still give him and my mom tech support whenever they need me. Okay, maybe that's the one downside. If you want to give GoToAssist Express a try, visit gotoassist.com slash Texilla to start your free 30-day trial. And support us by supporting our sponsors. Looks like it's time for another website we just can't get enough of. A website that we just can't stay away from because it's too useful, too funny, or just too darn irresistible. This week's pick, a little more on the serious side, Google Crisis Response. As I'm sure you're aware, the country of Haiti was hit by a massive earthquake, and there are many different places online where you can donate money to support the people in need. If you're confused about where to give money, make a stop to Google's crisis response page. Google is donating a million dollars to the support efforts, and also gives you a way to donate to UNICEF and CARE automatically through Google Checkout. If you have another fund you'd like to donate to, the page also gives links to many other vetted charities, such as the Red Cross, Save the Children, Habitat for Humanity, and more. Google Crisis Response also lists the charities that accept donations via text message and tells you the numbers and messages to send. If you're looking for someone that may be missing after the earthquake or have information about someone, the Person Finder is one way to begin your search. It could be a way to help connect families that have been torn apart after the disaster. Google Voice is also offering free calls to Haiti within the next few weeks and shows you how to get set up with an account if you need one. And since Google has its finger on the pulse of the news, you can always find the latest information right on this page about the disaster relief efforts and more. So to find out how you can help, check out Google Crisis Response today. Viewer questions, we love them, and wow, you guys sent in a lot this week, so we packed up a couple in here. Archie's eyeball on HDMI specs, and he writes in, I recently saw an advertisement on Newegg.com. They referred to HDMI cables by the different HDMI version numbers. Do the version numbers make a difference in HDMI cables? Oh, Archie, if your HDMI cable is under 15 or 20 feet, chances are you can ignore whatever's written on the cable or, or claims to be written on the cable. Yeah, if for some crazy reason you want a 45 or 100 foot HDMI run, then you want a CTS 1.3B or B1 certified cable. Uh, there's no such thing as an HDMI 1.3B cable. That's a testing certification for HDMI 1.3A cables. Sound messy? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it kind of is. <laughs> but to oversimplify, the 1.3 and later cables are more strictly tested than the 1.2 and earlier cables. The actual cable design itself didn't really change so much. Yeah, so, you know, HDMI 1.4, we've heard a lot about that lately. That's supposedly what you're going to need to, to run the 3D HDTV spec ah, between your important. new 3D HDTV Blu-ray player or PS3 and your 3D HDTV. Um, look, if you want to get super geeky on HDMI cables, Archie, I highly recommend the Blue Gene cables right up what do these HDMI spec versions mean up at Blue Jean, bluejeanscables.com. That said, I've bought a lot of no brand HDMI cables. If you're under 12 feet, chances are you're not going to see any difference no matter which brand of cable you're running. It's theoretically possible, but the reality is most of the expensive cables out there that have stuff on the box that talk about their super high definition compliance or mostly marketing fluff. If you do want to buy a really nice cable, check out BlueJeansCable.com. They actually have American-made cables, mm -hmm. which is almost oh, nice. impossible because almost all of the cables uh, that are out there, no matter what brand they come from, come from a handful of cable companies in China. Uh, you would just want a cheap cable. Monoprice.com is really, really good. Or you can always go with Monster Cable. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Don't do that. <laughs> Anyhow, one more question? Absolutely. <laughs> All right, well, Brian's looking to build a media server. I just built a home NAS and media server around the Drobo, and now I'm looking at different Linux-based DLNA UPnP media servers for it. Do you guys have any favorites? This is a custom Linux server, not a Drobo share, so I'm not limited by what that thing can handle. Mm. Very cool. Actually, no, it's nice because then you get sort of the ridiculous upgradable storage options of a Drobo, but you don't have to deal with being restricted. 
My favorite right now, probably still MediaTube. Uh, Myth TV is really good. Diversity is also mm-hmm. good. There are like 32,000 options for this, but I would say start with a MediaTube and build out from there. I'd also be curious if the audience would like us to build a MediaTube and talk about the different settings and aspects of that on this show. We've had a lot of questions about Myth TV lately, mm. so I think that might be cool. So v- email us, Myth TV or MediaTube. We will build one. Well, we might be able to build one before the end of the month. It's a new year. How about starting it off with a new website? And what better place to get that than at GoDaddy.com? They've got everything you need to create your own little corner on the net. Month-to-month contracts? Check. Dot-com names as little as a buck ninety-nine. They got them. How about free 24-7 support? It's there. They even offer website builders that'll have you up and running in no time. Virtual dedicated servers? No problem. GoDaddy has a whole variety of options to get you the features you need. But that's not all. Use the code TECH14 when you check out to score a .biz domain for only $7.49. Then head over to my.biz to enter for the chance to win $25,000. The contest ends soon, so don't miss out. Enter now at my.biz. All right, we got this email from Jack, who has a question about something near and dear to my heart. Jack writes, I'm planning on building a gaming PC. Ha, huh, how ironic. Mainly to run World of Warcraft. Weird. I'll probably be using a Radeon 5850 or a 5770, but I am having trouble choosing a processor. Should I use a Core i5 or a Core i7 for specifically World of Warcraft? Wow. We cool. don't know anything about that question. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah, like, go with the i5. You'll be paying a lot more for an i7. I, I say, go with, if you're not, like, doing video editing and you're not doing, like, big giant photo editing or you're not doing well, the a whole lot of the difference is going to be so incremental, like, right. like between the i5 and the i7. Like, you're going to get a on little World bit of, of a Warcraft. Re- on World of Warcraft. Yeah, for all that stuff I was Other talking stuff, about, then you can justify getting a core i7. For a World of Warcraft machine? It's not. You're not going to get that much difference for the price. Right. At least in my opinion, everything that I, everyone I've talked to and everything I've read online has all, you know, pretty much pointed to the fact that Core i5 should run World of Warcraft pretty awesomely. Um, it's not as taxing to contemporary PC hardware as it was when it was first shipping, um, and new updates have added emphasis on 3D graphics performance, but not on the level of first-person shooters like Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 or Left 4 Dead 2. It's a really scalable game. I mean, it can work on a lot of different levels of systems. Yeah. When it came out, it would tax a processor. Now it's like, meh. Well, Wrath of the Lich King, a lot of people use that as a benchmarking mm-hmm. kind of thing because it does have a little more you know, 3D graphic intensive stuff going on. That said. That said, you should be fine. I mean, realistically, unless you're gaming on a machine using Intel's integrated graphics, you should be good to go with a Core i5. And if you do go with a Core i5, we suggest you pick the 750. As we've said before, the Core i5 750 is considered by many, including our buddy Lloyd Case, to be the sweet spot when it comes to gaming CPUs. Mm. All right. Well, we have one more question today. Our final question comes from Josh in Philly. He writes, I'm thinking of getting rid of my cable because I'm a broke college student. Is it worth it to buy a Roku or BoxyBox if I already have an Xbox 360? I have Netflix, subscribe to video feeds through Zune and Tversity, and have a decent-sized personal media library. I love new tech. I'm a computer engineering student, so that's kind of a duh. But do they do anything that much more than what I can do on my Xbox already? Thanks, Josh from Philly. Well, yes, it can always be fun to get new stuff like superfluous set-top boxes, but you've already got a pretty good thing going with the setup you already have. Um, personally, I love the Boxy Box. You know, we, we saw it at CES, and right. I've loved the Boxy software for a long time, but you probably don't need to add it to your collection. Unless you're desperate to be part of the Boxy Box community. Right. That's the one thing. It's got these, these social elements that are really nice, and it does have some content that you probably can't get on the Xbox 360, mm-hmm. like the Open University stuff and all the other widgets and programs that you can add there. Then he could run the boxy stuff on his PC. He's got a PC, so he can run the boxy software already. Exactly. Okay. That was going to be a point I was going I'm to get. Terribly but sorry. that's cool. <laughs> and the Roku box is nice, but it does pretty much one thing. I mean you can it watch shows and you can you can stream video and, and Netflix. And, and Amazon already, on demand and, and yeah. Amazon on demand, okay. But you've already got your Netflix <laughs> subscription and you like the way the Xbox three sixty works and the Xbox three sixty is one of the best ways and fastest ways to watch Netflix movies. Mm. So I, I don't know. I think you've got a pretty good thing going already. And plus, it's a Windows Media Extender, so you can watch or play anything via a network connection from a Windows Media Center, um, including TV, if you have a tuner card installed. Plus, it supports a wide variety of MPEG-4 and XFID formats. And if your current library happens to lean that way, 
you know, hint, hint. There are obviously some additional social features, like we mentioned, that you would enjoy with the Boxy Box, but if that's not very important to you, or if you're just happy watching Netflix movies with your, you know, Xbox 360 parties, you can do that now. You can watch movies with people in your party. Um, then you're probably fine. Plus, you can always get that additional Boxy content on your PC, like we said. Oh my goodness, yeah. You know, I say take the hundred bucks for it, it's must another Roku or the, or, or the concept of the boxy box. Take the money, have a party in your room, invite all your friends over to watch Texilla. Yeah, that's like that's like, <laughs> like it's okay. How many pizzas? A hundred bucks. It's like five pizzas. Five yeah. to seven. Five to seven pizzas, depending on how expensive your local, you know, college pizza joint is. And he's, well, he's in Philly. It's really good pizza. It's oh, it really is. Cheap. Good point. Ooh, let's go to Jim Steaks or Pat Steaks. Bite Jacker, people. If you haven't seen it, it is your guide to independent and downloadable games. I got a couple of great episodes from the Blip Festival 2010. If you dig music made from video games and old game consoles, you will not want to miss these episodes. They've got interviews and performances from all the chiptune greats, as well as interviews from the leading downloadable game developers like Gaijan Games, creators of the Bit.Trip series of WeWare Games, and Adam Saltzman, creator of Conobalt, one of the last year's massive hits on the iPhone. The first episode from Blimp Festival came out last week, and they've got another one for you this week. Do yourself a favor, head on over to revision3.com slash bikejacker and check out all the Blimp Festival action. For everybody out there watching, we live on your questions, so email us, techzilla at revision3.com. Tech help, product reviews, how tos, you ask us, we'll do it, but we need those emails. So don't be shy, send them on into techzilla at revision3.com. Or, of course, even better, send us in a video question. Think of all the fun you can have and the admiration of all of your friends and family when they see your mug on our show. Just keep it to 15 seconds, upload it to YouTube, and send us a link in an email with video question in the subject line. And as always, you can visit our forums at revision3.com slash forum. Share your thoughts, ideas, or comments with other fans of the show. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Veronica Belmont. Till next time, you've been watching Techzilla. I have boobs. <laughs> Apparently, they're spectacular. So I've heard. Wrong. <laughs> what did Come on, I do? Tell them about the puppy noses. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. And now I'm looking at different Linux-based DLNA UN. UPNP. <laughs> ah!